Good morning. I hope you're doing well today. Thank you for joining me as we continue our journey through the book of Ezekiel. I hope you're enjoying this journey through the prophets. And I know Ezekiel's a lot to bite off. He, he speaks with such big language, like the one that we saw yesterday. It just kind of feels, you, you kind of get disconnected from what's going on. Because he has this grand vision of who God is. This huge, uh, uh, almost spatial vision of the glory of God that um, it's wild and my goodness I wish we could just slow down and s just chew on it for a little bit but that's more like a, a very intentional sermon series maybe when I'm 50 I'll try that but for now we're working through the book of Ezekiel and we're on chapter 14 now I've chosen chapter 14 because it's a little more practical Ezekiel before this is told to do some more really prophety sort of things. He's told to go and dress as an exile forced out of the city that he's in to actually crawl through the wall of the small community that he's in and to, to eat his food with fear and trembling to show everybody around him what's happening to the people who were left in Jerusalem as they're being sent away in exile. Now, uh, as they're fleeing in exile. Now, uh, 14 though 14 is more standard prophet stuff and it's going to introduce at the very beginning some of the men from the community coming to talk to him um, and we don't really hear anything that they have to say that's not the focus the focus is what God has to say to them so let's read this text and hear the words that the Lord has to say to men and women who stand before God and who would come into his presence and call themselves his people and that's, that's, the, that's the line here. This isn't foreigners. This isn't strangers. These are people who consider themselves in good standing with God. So let's read. Then certain of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me. And the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, these men have taken their idols into their hearts and set the stumbling block of their iniquity before their faces. Should I indeed let myself be consulted by them? Therefore speak to them and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Any one of the house of Israel who takes an idol into his heart and sets a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, yet comes to the prophet, I the Lord will answer him, as he comes with multiple multitude of his idols, that I may lay hold of the hearts of the house of Israel, who are all estranged from me through their idols. So we have this moment where these men come to Ezekiel, um, maybe kind of like Jeremiah, the, the people came to Jeremiah at the same, about the same time to say, you know what, Ezekiel, calm down. Ezekiel, tone it down a little bit. Can you say something nice? Just a little nice message. But um, God speaks to Ezekiel as they're sitting there and he says, you know what, these guys have some problems. We're not told what they are. We're not told what the idols and the stumbling blocks that they are battling with are. But there's this moment where God says, I can't let that happen. And the reason he can't let that happen, that he needs to speak to them himself, is because he loves them. And because he doesn't want them to carry this weight of idolatry with them, because he longs for the whole people of Israel. And there's this beautiful moment where he looks at them and he says, they are a part of a greater whole. And as I treat them, I treat the whole. So he wants to draw them in and speak to them so that they would come to a place of repentance and come back to God. Therefore, says the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols. Turn away, from your, turn away your faces from all your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or of strangers who sojourn in Israel, who separates himself from me, taking his idols into his heart and putting the stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and yet comes to a prophet to consult me through him, I, the Lord, will answer him myself, and I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a byword and cut him off from the midst of my people. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And so there's both a great privilege that comes with this. Because when somebody would come to a prophet to ask a prophet something, they wouldn't always get an answer. But here, not only do they get an answer, but they get God speaks to them with an intentionality that he wants to draw them back. And at the same time, he says he sets his face against them. There's a sense that they will know the displeasure of the Lord until they have come to the place where they know the pleasure of the Lord. And if the prophet is deceived and speaks a word, 
I, the Lord, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and will destroy him from the midst of thy people Israel. And they shall bear their punishment. The punishment of the prophet and the punishment of the inquirer shall be alike, that the house of Israel may no more go astray from me, nor defile themselves any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people, and I may be their God, declares the Lord. And so this is this great warning that there's judgment for these men, that there's judgment if Ezekiel was to say any word other than the word that the Lord has given him. And then at the same time, he says, but there's this beautiful goal, a goal that we should long for, a goal that this people at this age didn't have, that they would be his people and he would be their God. In this sense, there's this intimacy and there's the authenticity, this renewal of relationship that they're longing for. And so that's the call in chapter 14. God says, I'm going to do all these things. I'm going to put my face against them. I'm going to speak strongly to them because ultimately I want them to put aside those idols to repent and to come to me. And this is the goal. In fact, here we see in a subset the goal of everything that God is doing through the destruction of Jerusalem and through Ezekiel's work with this people in a foreign land is so that the people would see that God longs for them. He longs to have that covenant relationship with them. He longs for them to turn and to return to him and be refreshed and renewed by his love. And the neat thing is, of course, all of that that's true for them is true for us. And yet we have something so much more beautiful in that because we have Christ who has done this great work on our behalf. And the fulfillment is here. We are his people and he is our God. And yet still that that weight falls heavy on each of us, that weight of um, checking our hearts and asking ourselves, are there idols that we have trusted in instead of God? Are there idols that we've put in front of our faces, whether they be success, whether they be um, relationships, whether they be um, politics, whether they be um, uh, the, us doing the best that we can, our own self-righteousness? All of these things, we say, well, I'll be happy when I have achieved this. Our health might be one of those. But then in the end, the answer is, no, the answer is simple. To know God and to draw near to God. He is the one who meets us. He is the one who we are intended for. And um, so we need to confess those idols. We need to cast them aside as we do every Sunday, crying out to God and praying that he would meet us where we're at, that he would renew us and call us his own people, that we might know the satisfaction of drawing near to him. Now that's what Ezekiel's working through here with these men. And it's interesting because the chapter ends there. It doesn't say what the elders said, but we can hope that they heard Ezekiel's words and they repented um, and they were able to renew a right relationship with God. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and we thank you this day for the glory of your love for us. We thank you for the way you have met us and you care for us. We thank you for the way that you have walked with us and called us your own. And um, Father, you've done that despite our brokenness, despite our folly. And you are working through us. Your Holy Spirit within us is convicting us. Even now, perhaps, convicting us of idols in our hearts and fears that are overwhelming us and... Um, longings and covetous uh, ideas and ideologies and uh, desires that oh, that distract us from your love. Forgive us for these things, Father. Renew within us a right spirit and uh, make us your people. Father, we pray for those today who are hurting, for those that are mourning. We pray for a world that is shaken and broken. We pray for Haiti. We pray for Ethiopia. We pray for Afghanistan. We pray, Father, for India. We pray for the church around the world that is in persecution. And we pray, Father, for those teachers that are going back to school this week and just getting things set up. Bless them, Lord. We pray for those young and new parents who are just getting used to having babies around the house and are learning all those essential things like how to best feed the baby and how to sleep with the baby. We pray for your protection and your, um, your safekeeping for them and for the little baby. And Father, we pray for those today that are mourning and feeling the, the hurt. Um, we praise you for that, Father. We pray that you would bless them. 
and comfort them. We ask all these things as we come before you today. Let our hearts be true to who you are as you call us in ever nearer to you. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for joining me today. God bless you. Bye-bye.